The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the testing that needs to be done in a perfect world to support concrete mixture development for paving. And if nothing else, the concrete mixtures uh, that we use to develop submittal information and that sort of thing really need to be supplemented by some additional testing during the proportioning and mix design process. And that's what we're talking about here. There are some challenges with that. And some of those challenges include the, uh, in, in many cases, relative unfamiliarity with the materials that you might be working with, particularly for paving contractors who travel around the country quite a bit. And we do have some new and, and develop, uh, developments in, in cementitious materials, uh, certainly in admixtures, uh, supplementary cementitious materials as well, including uh, some changes in, in the maybe flash properties and performance and so forth. So these things are all adding to our complications uh, for understanding <clears throat> how one particular set of materials is going to behave for us. And in order to really optimize the performance as well as to achieve uh, uh, sustainability interests, which are becoming quite a focal point uh, in many projects, um, you really need to do a little bit more testing than perhaps we used to do. Now, I'm mainly going to be talking about the paste fraction part of our concrete mixture because that's where so many different variables may be today, uh, particularly as we get into the sustainable mixtures that may contain less and less uh, Portland cement clinker and higher proportions of supplementary cementitious materials uh, that may even complicate life and require additional admixtures, higher admixture dosages, and so forth. So there are so many variables. It just doesn't make sense to go find a set of materials that are available at a low cost, throw them together, and make the best concrete you can out of it. Why not do some preliminary work to know that we're going to be optimizing performance? These are the things that we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, accommodate or, or to, to uh, minimize set retardation. We're trying to speed up the um, sluggish strength gain that we might experience from some of these influences on the front end. And certainly uh, we want to understand um, what may now be variability, greater variability of performance as influenced by weather changes and things like that. You know, and optimizing this performance is critical for obvious reasons. You can read those bullet points as well as I can uh, for pavements. And the, the important thing, and this one escapes some users of these materials, is that every time you change one material in a concrete mixture, you change the behavior of the mix. And you may change the behavior of the mix more than you possibly imagine. And the time to know that is on the front end rather than after you've collected these materials and gone to, into a project. Um, so how do we do this? How do we evaluate and, and, and supplement our, our mixed design process with testing in an intelligent way? Certainly we can do that with concrete batches. And in a perfect world, we would put up dozens or even hundreds of concrete batches to answer all the different related questions that we may have about a set of candidate materials and some alternative materials. That may be a little bit impractical because of the uh, time and labor that's required, certainly the laboratory itself and the equipment, availability of technicians. There's a relatively limited number of the batches that we can put up every day in concrete, and it becomes a little bit more difficult to model the field temperatures that we may be experiencing with concrete mixes. Temperature modeling becomes more and more critical as we get into more and more of these variables. Now here's an alternative that if you 
have a cement lab, you might want to consider. If you've got a cement lab, quality control uh, laboratory at a cement plant, for example, a lot of technicians hanging around, maybe the plant's down. You can run mortar cube batches and uh, VICAT testing for setting trends, and it works quite well. You can modify those methods a little bit, use the actual chemical admixtures. There are some challenges, and uh, part of that is that you haven't really reduced the time and labor requirements much. And you still have a limited number of batches per day that's possible. And it's not generally possible to vary the water cementitious ratio in cement cube, um, in mortar cubes, because you generally have to make those according to a constant flow. There are some new alternative procedures under development in ASTM that uh, may make this a little bit more useful in the future, but there are some challenges involved here. What I'd really, uh, and again, it's, it's kind of difficult to simulate the job temperatures with, with more cubes. What I'd really like to talk a little bit more about is something that's new and evolving that I think you'll be seeing more of in the future, a really quick and dirty way to get some basic information about how the different materials that you're interested in using might contribute to the performance that you're interested in, and even how to optimize the proportions before you take these into concrete mixtures for your mix of middle information. And that what I'm talking about is laboratory paste that's a fluid plate paste. It's not like a VICAT te uh, test. It's a fluid paste that's made with simple equipment, very inexpensive equipment, very little, relatively little comparative um, time requirements compared to concrete or mortar. And with, because of that and the simple equipment that's required, you can do dozens of these in a single day and learn quite a bit of information. Now, we actually use uh, compressive strength testing of these laboratory paste batches to benchmark strength development of these mixes and compare them with variables that we change in subsequent mixes. And we get the setting trends and setting information from the different changes that we make based on thermal profiles of the, um, of the paste mixes. And we'll talk about exactly how that works here. Here's the equipment and the general procedures that we use in doing this. Uh, that's the, the laboratory that, uh, that I use. Uh, very simple equipment. We got some laptops set up for thermal data collection during the, uh, the, the, the paste uh, data collection. Uh, most of this equipment comes from either bargain basement online orders or was picked up at the Walmart store. Okay. And what we do is we develop a set of paste proportions and we change uh, one, one material or one proportion for dozens and dozens of subsequent mixes so that we can compare them all. The way we do it is we, we use um, plastic <coughs> food containers to weigh up the powder, the cement, the slag, the fly ash, whatever we're, we're using, we weigh up all the powder ingredients together for testing the next day. We may even temperature condition the powder overnight and then it, for, during the day of testing, we simply pour the powder in a, a mixing bowl. We weigh up the batch water mix by mix. And at that time, we use a medical type syringe to introduce the uh, chemical admixtures. And then we pour the paste from each mix into two by four cylinders, real small two by four cylinders. We're going to be collecting the thermal data. You can see blocks that are sitting in ambient conditions here. This is in a temperature controlled uh, water bath type curing tank. <clears throat> and we use that to simulate any temperature regime you're interested in from cold weather to hot weather. Uh, and you can precondition the materials in the same <clears throat> tank. Later on, we'll actually use a compression uh, test uh, to document the strengths uh, at different ages of interest. And then we use the thermal profile for uh, the setting information. Now, this sounds pretty far-fetched, but there's actually some ASTM standards on this that are in, in development. And there's two different documents that are very close to coming out. One of them is um, just how to use the, uh, the, the thermal profile method to investigate all kinds of different questions relating to uh, hydration uh, evolution. The other is a the, the setting time type uh, investigation using thermal data of either concrete, mortar, or paste. And you'll be seeing more and more on those methods 
uh, in the near future. Now, just a quick background. Here's what a typical thermal profile looks like. All this is is a temperature history of a small sample of the cement paste that we just mixed over the first, 20, in this case, 16 hours. Sometimes we plot it for 24 to 30 hours. The, the interesting, the useful points of this uh, profile are, begin with the initial temperature peak, which is the C3A of the cement hydrating. And the second feature of interest is the dormant period, which is the, the part of uh, the concrete process that allows us to place and finish concrete before setting time. And then we have the main event, which we know to be related primarily to tricalcium silicate hydration. And in the main event is when we actually see the setting and the strength development of our concrete uh, in that first few number of hours. Now, what we usually see is that if you correlate penetrometer setting time from a concrete mix, this is about the point on that curve where you see the initial set of concrete occur. It's roughly 20% or so of the temperature rise between the dormant period and the peak. And that is, uh, uh, is one way to do this, and it's, it's been done um, many times with concrete mixes to approximate the C403 setting time. But another way that we use it is to just either visually or in a spreadsheet select the halfway point as just a reference of the approximate timing differences between different mixes. We'll take a look at how that works too. Now, Paul Sandberg is, uh, pr should probably be credited with doing the great bulk of the early work that related these uh, fractions of that main peak temperature rise to specific concrete setting properties. And when Paul was at Grace and some of his colleagues there, uh, they did hundreds, maybe thousands of these comparison mixes in, in actual concrete, penetrometer setting versus thermal uh, fractions. And what we find is that on the average, 21% and 42% of the main temperature rise are the uh, pretty good approximations of where the uh, initial and the final sets occur based on C403 testing. Then later on, we'll actually do the compressive testing of the hardened paste specimens, and it doesn't tell us exactly what the concrete strength would be, but in a relative sense, it does a great job of telling us how the concrete mixed strength would change based on the change that we did in the, uh, in the paste proportions. And we do this essentially according to C39. In our experience, we've used neoprene caps primarily, and it produces very repeatable data. Uh, you can also use sulfur compounds, but I haven't really had experience with that. Right now, we're, we're playing with machining the ends of these uh, paste, hardened paste specimens for testing without neoprene caps, and the jury's still out on that, but I think we're, we're in the right direction. All right, here's some information of interest, and everybody probably has a curi the question in your mind now. How do these paste setting and strength trends compare to actual concrete setting and strength trends? Uh, and for that matter, how, they, how would they compare if you did this with mortar in the laboratory, mortar and vicat? So here's, here's a, uh, an example of that in this particular case. The data comes from, a, from an experiment uh, series in which we were comparing the performance of two different kinds of cement. One was a type 2 uh, cement, the other was a, a type 1L Portland limestone cement from the same plant. Uh, and looking at the, uh, how those two different cements, um, how they perform with a class C fly ash. The control mixes have no fly ash and the, the uh, <coughs> mixes of interest have an extreme 40% replacement with that sea ash. And this uh, data also has a set of three chemical admixtures in it. It was modeled after a field concrete mixture that we had experience with. Uh, I don't have, and I apologize for this, the concrete was done in a different place, different conditions. Don't have one day strengths on the concrete. Likewise, I don't have 56 day strengths on the paste, but you can get the feel of things. The interesting thing is that we do see the same trends no matter which method we use. What this data tells us is that in concrete, we saw very close to the same strengths uh, with, uh, between the, the type 1, 2 ordinary Portland cement and the type 1L Portland limestone cement in these mixtures um, when they did not have any fly ash. But with 40% sea ash, we saw that the Portland limestone cement 
began to excel at all ages, and that's what we see with, this, with these materials in the field. Um, the setting times, which are on the axis over here, with penetrometers we see slightly shorter sets with the Portland limestone cement. And that was uh, what we saw throughout all the concrete data that we, we collected. Uh, the mortar cube test, and again, this is not uh, replicating the water cementitious ratio. This was done at constant flow, so this is one element of comparison that arguably might be missing. But you see the same trends, VICAT setting and versus uh, you see much better performance with the Portland limestone cement when the sea ash is introduced, um, same trends. Uh, in, the, in the case of paste, and first I'd, just to focus on the thermal derived setting time trends, we do see the same trends. Or, or, or these numbers are higher than in the case of the penetrometer or the VICAT numbers, but remember they're 50% fraction numbers. If we wanted to replicate those, we could go back to maybe a 20-25% fraction or some percentage of the 50% fraction, and you would see virtually the identical uh, uh, numbers as well as um, the trends. But the trends are the same. Interestingly, the comparisons, the differences every time you change a variable in paste mixtures are actually usually amplified slightly in, the, in strengths. And that is consistent with, you know, it's kind of intuitive really when you think about taking the aggregates out. The other side of that coin is, the, I don't have data that backs this up, but my feel is the precision of that data is probably higher. I hope to collect some data on that for the next paper. But, but this is the way those trends compare. Every time you change a variable, you can begin to see what would happen with that same variable in concrete. Here's another example. Uh, several different concrete mixtures with, way, well, with the same uh, sample of cement, two different ashes, uh, a C and an F, one ternary mix with uh, uh, slag and ash, different admixtures, just to give us a range of different um, performance, and here's how the, the C403 initial concrete setting times, which are the solid bars, compare to the 50% fractions, which are the striped bars. You see the same trends throughout that concrete. So uh, this, we've done so many of these that we have complete confidence in our ability to, um, to model what's going on in the concrete this way. So how can you use this? Well, there's a variety of different things that you can that you can do in the proportioning process to apply these, this uh, method. Uh, certainly just screening of materials to pick the best material that works with the other materials you're using or perhaps even the admixture dosages or the SEM replacement rates. You can do all that kind of stuff with this method and you can even apply it to the optimization of the proportions in the, in the initial process if, and I'll show you an example of how that works before you go to, to uh, trial batches. Uh, another thing that's very useful is to be able to check and see how changes in job temperatures might affect these particular materials in proportions. Here's an example in, in which we were trying to pick an admixture product that would be optimum with, with our materials, and we're interested in the retardation effects. These are five different admixture, six different admixture uh, formulations um, in which we are I'm sorry, five different ones that we have a control with no admixture, in which we are um, looking at the retardation effects. Two of these are lignans, that's the AD uh, samples. Two of these are polycarboxyl, that's the AF samples. One is a mid-range product that has a blended base. Uh, and you can see that they, uh, as, as you might imagine, the, the lignans have the most retardation. Uh, but even though among the polycarboxyl, one, one has much more retardation than the other. So these are useful things to, to uh, and, and the dosage rates were selected based on roughly 6% water reduction characteristics. You can use the same process to uh, take maybe a particular complex or aggressive mix you, that you might have had experience with and compare how different cements, different cement sources might perform. Uh, retardation effects in that complex mix. There's even the question of incompatibility. We forced one of the cements, in this case the F one, into uh, completely incompatible, incompatible behavior, which shows up in thermal profiles by uh, either delaying or eliminating the calcium silicate main peak. 
Um, so here's an exercise of how we might apply this to the mixture development process. And the, the challenge in this hypothetical example is to develop a, a, an especially sustainable concrete mix for this pavement project with unfamiliar materials using at least 50% replacement of cement. Okay, now that's very aggressive, a little unusual for pavement, but it can be done. And the project temperatures are going to be uh, anywhere from, you know, essentially ambient up to 95 degrees or so. The first thing that we probably want to do is take some traditional materials and mixes that we've already used and that we're familiar with how they perform for, for this pavement construction uh, method. Here's three different ones that I picked out and put up the paste fractions of those mixes using uh, from 15% you know, C ash or F ash or 30% slag with mild water reducer doses. In one case, uh, with the F ash, we're actually using a lignin in this example, which does contribute a little bit of retardation. But this gives us a range of, a, of what will be acceptable setting times, thermal setting performances for the target mix. And we also document the one day strengths and come up with a fairly arbitrary, in this case, uh, target for our strength range at one day that will give us uh, relatively crack-free performance in the paving mix. That's roughly between 2,000 and 3,000 PSI. What happens when you do nothing else but increase the cement replacement rates to the, to the objective 50% level? Well, the first thing that happens is we lose a lot of one-day strength, but we also see some, some of the mixes are now retarded in setting as well. That's intuitive. We understand that will happen. Uh, in this case, it's probably not fair to use the AD, the lignin water reducer anymore because it introduces uh, uh, retardation. So we put in another F-ash mix with the same um, polycarboxyl as we're using elsewhere. And right now, both the F-ash mix and the slag mix are within our target setting range still, but the C-ash mix is now too retarded for us. We're going to have to do something with it. But in all cases, our one-day strength is inadequate. So the next thing we probably want to do is boost our one-day strength by lowering the water cementitious ratio with additional admixture dose. And that will change the performance of the mixes in all kinds of ways. So if we <coughs> reduce our water cementitious ratio to about 0.32 for most of these, we can begin to get the one day strengths where we need them, but now we've caused additional retardation in all cases. So now in addition to the lower water cementitious ratio, now we're going to need to accelerate these mixes to give us the same performance for the pavement application. We're going to need to use non-chloride accelerators so we don't corrode our dowels and things. So that's the next step. And by the way, I've thrown in a 60% slag mix in this comparison just for curiosity, but um, never mind on that. Okay, if you start introducing the non-chloride accelerator, one of the thing, one of the side effects is we expect that to raise the one-day strength. So we're already marginally there. We should, our one-day strength should be quite good now. And, but we uh, are going to have to moderate the amount of that accelerator to get our target setting time within the, the band that we're interested in. In the case of the slag cement, 50% um, slag cement is not terribly unusual. It's still a pretty happy system even without much accelerator. As a matter of fact, you can over, overdo the accelerator with that. So it doesn't take much accelerator dose at all. About a 20 fluid ounce per 100 weight dose uh, of this particular non chloride accelerator, and you're good to go. Uh, with the, with the F-ash, again, it doesn't take a great deal of uh, accelerator. Uh, to get us back in that range, and again, it, you get the one-day strength benefits of that, and the, the, the quicker the set, the higher the one-day strength. But with the C-ash system, we have some problems. First of all, even time, by the time we get to a maximum dosage of the non-chloride accelerator, the acceleration that provides with this system at 50% replacement is still not adequate to get us in the setting time band. And even the, the strengths at one day are not getting back into where we, we need to see but because of the shape of the curves, we can begin to suspect some incompatibility of materials now. If you want to confirm that, the same test method is very useful for that by taking some of that, one of those incompatible mixes and introducing additional sulfates, additional gypsum, which is what incompatibility is mostly about, into the subsequent uh, mixtures. And we find that, yes, indeed, now we do see normal shape curves 
and we do see the return of one-day strength. So what that tells us is, yes, this was incompatibility, and that the sea ash mix will probably not be a viable candidate at 50 percent. Now, we might could have developed a 40 or 35 percent sea ash mix that might have worked. Last thing we want to do is just <coughs> uh, confirm that we don't see anything unusual happen when we go to extreme field temperatures so that we can do that in our laboratory tank. And um, the F ash and the slag mix are both fine. We can probably back off on the accelerator, the higher temperatures, of course. But you can see how this can be used to explore all kinds of different questions. And these are the, the, the conclusions that we would make from that um, series of, of, of events. Now, the question comes up, why is the temperature investigation so important, the, the thermal range? And as you get into hotter weather, we see faster and faster setting, of, but the more cementitious replacement with SCMs, the more sensitive that becomes. The other thing that happens is if there's any danger of incompatibility, it begins to show up more in hot weather than it does in cool weather because the solubility of calcium sulfate actually decreases as we get warmer and war warmer. So this is just, this is just another example, <coughs> um, not even the same materials, of, of uh, an event in which we have four different mixes, some with, with uh, as the control, there's one with some sea ash, 25% sea ash replacement. There's one with, that puts a water reducer on top of that and a higher dose of the water reducer on top of that. And we see the one-day strengths that you would expect from that, and we see the retardation that you would expect from that at 70 degrees. At 93 degrees, we drive the ones with the water reducer into some state of incompatibility, and in the extreme, the higher water reducer dose, we forced it into classical sulfate balance incompatibility, and that mix would not take a normal set and begin to gain strength for at least 24 to 48 hours. So there's all kinds of things that you can do with a very simple method. Put it up today, get your data back tomorrow, and uh, you can even do seven day, 28 day, whatever, how many, um, whatever age of, of these uh, compressive tests that you might like. So with that, I hope you'll, you'll uh, follow the development of this and the implementation thereof. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.